Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our latest uh, edition of programming via the virtual playhouse. Um, my name is Dan, I'm the Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. And uh, we're very grateful to all of you for joining us this evening for what I'm sure is gonna be a really, really great presentation. Um, a couple of very quick um, housekeeping things for those of you who uh, may still be new to Zoom uh, at this point uh, in our uh, social distancing lives. Uh, there is a Q&A button, which you can find at the bottom of your screen if you are uh, on a laptop or a PC. Um, I believe if you're on a uh, handheld device, it's towards the top of your screen. Uh, at any point, please feel free to post a question. Um, and uh, Elizabeth and Amy are gonna talk for a bit and then they will open up the uh, form for questions. So please, uh, anything you'd like. Uh, we ask you refrain from using the chat feature. Uh, that tends to get a little bit confusing. So please post your questions through the Q&A. Um, just very quickly, uh, as I mentioned, this is a virtual playhouse, the Bedford Playhouse. Uh, is still going through the effects of social distancing, although um, we do have uh, permission from the governor to reopen and we are targeting this Friday as our reopening date. Uh, but if you uh, are so inclined, if you enjoy what you see here this evening, uh, please, before you shut your devices down, consider going to our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org uh, and perhaps making a contribution to help us uh, get back on our feet and back to business as usual as close to po as possible. Um, we should mention right now, we are in the middle of a matching gift uh, drive with Arts Westchester. So anybody who is a first time donor uh, to the Playhouse, if you've never given before, any amount that you donate uh, gets matched by Arts Westchester up to $1,500. Um, so please consider uh, that you're making some support uh, if you enjoy it. Uh, all that being said, I wanna welcome to the screen, uh, one of our favorite people, Elizabeth Weed who's going to uh, take you the rest of the way. Thank hey, Elizabeth. You, Dan. I did. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> and thank you to the Bedford Playhouse for facilitating tonight. And I'm so excited that you'll be opening soon. Amy, yeah, can you? finally. Yes, finally. Um, and I'm so excited that I get to introduce uh, Amy Malloy, who's a very dear friend and author that I've had the pleasure of working with for now coming on six years. Yeah. Uh, Amy is the author of Good Night Beautiful, which we'll be talking about tonight, as well as The Perfect Mother, which was an instant New York Times bestseller. She is also the author of several works of nonfiction, including the New York Times bestseller, However Long the Night, and Rosewater, which was turned into a feature film written and directed by Jon Stewart. Her books have been translated into more than 25 languages. Uh, and she also has a long and very interesting career as a ghostwriter. So <laughs> I thought it made sense tonight to start with our book, Good Night Beautiful. But I'm also terrified to talk about this book to anybody who hasn't read it because there are so many spoilers and I am just very fearful that I'm gonna give one away. So. I'm going to punt this question to you, Amy. <laughs> Tell us about your book. <laughs> um, well, um, it's nice to be here. Thank you, Bedford Playhouse. I've been doing a bunch of events, um, but I love Elizabeth, and I've been looking forward to this for weeks. So, uh, good night, beautiful. It's um, it's a psychological thriller. It is about a newlywed couple named Sam and Annie who meet in New York. Um, have a whirlwind romance, get married after a few months, and then decide to leave the city and move upstate to the country to Sam's hometown, um, a quaint little village uh, in upstate New York, and uh, to take care of his mother, who's been moved into a long-term facility for dementia. And he's a therapist, and he opens a home office um, and starts a private practice. And, you know, he's, he has this reputation as a heartbreaker. He thinks he's reformed. He's madly in love with his wife. He's committed to being faithful to her. Um, and he opens up his practice and it's filled with, you know, lots of women from town who have heard that the cute, you know, therapist from high school is back. Uh, and they all line up to see him. And little does he know that in, a, in the ceiling is a vent through which every word of his sessions can be heard. And so, you know, the question is like, if you're in this position and you could hear into someone you love's therapy sessions, uh, would you do it? And in this case, the answer is yes. 
and listening <laughs> happens. Um, a cute French girl shows up as a new patient, um, sparks fly between Sam and she, um, and then they, uh, well, I won't say too much, but then he, he, he tells his wife that he's on his way home one night and he doesn't show up. And so the second part of the book is kind of about what happened to Sam. And um, as Elizabeth said, it's really weird to talk about because that's what the book is about, but it's also not at all about that. Uh, you know, it's sort of a lot about um, other things and um, assumptions that readers make. Um, it's about, you know, gender and it's, um, you know, so it's, it's about a lot and, and it's a hard book to talk about. So, but we'll do our best. We're going we're gonna to do our best. And I, I have to say, so the book came out on Tuesday. Um, it has gotten just so much praise, both from reviewers, but also from consu consumers who are reading it. And not that I'm checking our Goodreads or Amazon's reviews regularly, but I am, and they're amazing. Um, and I would just add if, if for those of you reading and loving it or reading and loving any book, um, posting a review there really does mean the world to authors and to the algorithms that go on in, in selling books. Um, but once the book uh, was finished and edited and put into production, our job, the publisher's job and the agent's job is to send it out to get um, blurbs from authors. And I just want to take a minute to read a very long blurb that didn't, the whole thing did not make it onto the book um, by A.J. Finn, who uh, wrote the runaway bestseller, uh, Woman in the Window. Um, and he said, a busy psychotherapist, his lonely wife, and in the middle, uh, and in their home office, a ceiling vent like a radio, tune in, sit back and listen to station after station, midlife crises, sexual frustrations, marital woes, You'd eavesdrop too, wouldn't you? You know you would. We live and read in an age where publishers, this is a little snarky, so we didn't put this on the book, but I'm gonna be snarky. We live and read in an age where publishers bill every other novel as psychological suspense. Most of these are neither psychological nor suspenseful. Some tick both boxes without much finesse. And rarely, so rarely, a writer like Amy Malloy favors us with a thriller like Goodnight Beautiful. It's cunning for sure, constructed with house of cards precision, and the story surges forward as though powered by outboard motor. But Malloy's, Malloy proves particularly skilled in the elusive arts of character and dialogue. Goodnight Beautiful isn't only the most suspenseful novel you'll read this year, it's likely to be the funniest too. I wish that every book and every genre was deeply imagined and fully inhabited as this one. Which brings me to my next question, which is, you almost didn't write this book. <laughs> <laughs> you almost wrote a different book. Um, and I would love to hear about, uh, well, I'll, I'll set it up for you and just say that uh, Amy and I started working together um, when she wrote her debut novel, The Perfect Mother. And right before that book published, we were talking to her fabulous editor, Jennifer Barth, about a next book. And Amy came up with this really great idea called The Hiding Place and a few pages of it and Harper Collins bought the book and Amy went on her way to write it. And then what happened? <laughs> uh, and then all hell broke loose. Yes. Um, so I wrote most of the book. Um, I think we had sold it on hundred pages. And so I had like yeah. 200 more pages to write. And so it was, you know, I had this outline. I was like, no problem, I can do this. And so, um, so I wrote it, but it was always, it, there was, it just wasn't gelling for me. And as I got closer to the end, you know, we were all like, it'll work out, it'll work out. And even with The Perfect Mother, you know, there's this big twist that happens at the end of that book that I feel like made that book work. And I didn't know until I got there that that was in my head or somewhere. And so I was trusting that this was going to happen with The Hiding Place and it didn't, and it just kept falling short. Um, and the premise was the same. It was a husband and wife. They move upstate. He's a therapist. She's upstairs. She listens into his sessions, you know, and becomes obsessed with it. Um, and so I think there were two things that were happening. One was that it didn't feel like the book was really special. It felt sort of like rote and, and you know, it was like would have been one of a million books sort of. Um, but the other thing that was happening was that the wife in the book was was unlike Annie in the, in Goodnight Beautiful, who's very confident and like pretty self-assured. This wife was sort of like, is she crazy? Is she not crazy? Can we believe her? Can we not believe her? And Me Too was happening at the time. And, you know, I kept on, I was reading the stories and watching this movement happening. 
And then I was returning to my work and writing about a woman who we didn't know if we should take her for her word. And it was really unsettling to me and like sitting very wrong. And so there was one day, June 5th, that I had this idea pop into my head that was about different characters, which eventually became Goodnight Beautiful. And the premise was the same, you know, it's still a husband and wife move upstate and listening in on a therapy session, but every single character was completely different. And I remember being like, oh shit, this is, can I say shit? But like, oh shit, this is, you know, this is, a, this is a better idea. And I think I can make this one work. And I think it would be a, like a better book. And so I remember I email you at 10 in the morning and I was like, hey, you know, just like hypothetically speaking, if one sells a book and there, we were three weeks away from the deadline, <laughs> there was a cover, there was like a marketing plan. We had sold the movie rights to the girl on the train team. And I was like, hypothetically, let's <laughs> pretend that I like have an idea for like a better way to tell this story but it includes maybe like possibly throwing away the whole thing and starting over. And then, you know, and then I was like, oh, it's fine. It's going to go away. This is going to go away. And then by noon, I think I was like texting you and I was like, hey, just maybe check your email. And then like at three, I was like, we need to talk. This is a serious problem. <laughs> and you were like, and I just happened to have, my husband was taking the kids away for the weekend so I could finish the hiding place. And I had this weekend retreat planned and you were like, take a deep breath, write a few pages, see what's there and let's talk. And so on Sunday, I think I had like 75 pages of the new, this new idea. You read it right away and you called Jennifer, our editor. And by Monday, we were like sitting at lunch in a restaurant in New York. I know, <laughs> back when we went to restaurants and Jennifer <laughs> jokes that we ambushed her at that lunch, but we really were so nervous that she would say no, that we thought if we told her in person, it would work out better for yeah. everybody. And, she's and she was great, but we were like, you know, laughable and so smart and got it and gave you that extra time. Yeah. And, and so, right. So she gave us it. a whole year to like, yeah. re, re, you know, rewrite it, but it meant I had to like throw away 290 pages right. worth of work and sort of start over. Um, yeah. Which I don't recommend doing. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk about, I, I'd for, I, know, I know that, but I'd forgotten that and how the sort of Me Too movement had, was just in your head and, and you just were like, I can't write this book anymore. Um, your first book, The P Perfect Mother, I think both of your novels do something similar that I really appreciate. Uh, they're both just propulsively readable. You just zip, zip, zip from a plot point of view, you just want to get to the end and figure out the twists and the turns. But there's also this, these themes going on beneath the surface, again, without giving too much away with Goodnight Beautiful, there, you know, you sort of delve into this idea of male toxicity and sort of how we raise boys. Um, and in The Perfect Mother, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a really good book. Uh, it takes place in Brooklyn, it, uh, it's a bunch of uh, new mom friends who sort of met online and are really meeting for the first time in the park and talking about sleep training and all those things you talk about when you have a baby that I can't remember. <laughs> and very early on in the book, one of the babies is taken. And so on one level, it's like, who took this baby? His name was Midas, because this was when she was living in Brooklyn and he needed a Brooklyn name. Who took Midas? And, but on another level, it's about this sense of being a perfect mother, of having your career, having this baby, always looking fine, losing the weight. And you really like delved into it through these moms who were really struggling um, in this new time. And it, you know, it never felt like it was hitting you over the head, but I guess my question is what comes first for you when, when you're writing a book? Is it, is it, is it the plot and the twists or is it like, here's what I want to get into? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I feel like much like having a newborn, you completely forget what right. happened, Perfect. you know, when you're writing a book. So um, I know for this, an idea that we're kind of, we're batting around right now uh, for like a, for another book, it's more, it's definitely like, it's, it's the message and it's, you know, the thing that, um, like it's at the crux of it. And it's like how, do, which in this case is sort of, you know, more about like the rise of the alt-right in this country and the impact that that's having just on, um, you know, everything and the tie into reality television, um, you know, and so that's the thing that I want to explore. And so I think it's, 
it's um and it was the same thing with the perfect mother actually like you know I was I don't know if we probably talked about all this but you know I wanted to write about new motherhood and I was reading like Jenny Ophel like uh Department of Speculation and like this book 11 Hours by Pamela Ahrens which is about like it's just the 11 hours of a woman's labor and there were these like really beautiful books about motherhood and I was like I think after having my second, I was like, I would like to try this. I would like to try fiction. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I would like to give it a, give it a shot. And um, I just didn't feel like I was like, I wasn't there yet as a writer to try and attempt something that was like very poetic. And not that writing suspense I think is easier, but it comes more naturally to me. And so, you know, I think it was like fine. Once I read Gone Girl in the middle of this, I was like, oh, maybe this is my way into writing about motherhood is like to do something page turny and right. suspenseful, you know? And so I do think it's like that underneath part that comes first for me. Well, you did it very well. I, I'm actually, I wanted to go back to the beginning of your writing trajectory, but that's actually a good point to jump in because you had a different agent for um, your nonfiction and um, you were also uh, writing, well, actually, no, I, let me go back to the beginning because I actually do have, I, I don't actually know the answer to this question, but I mean, you've been writing a lot of books and you've been writing for a long time, but did you grow up always thinking you wanted to be a writer? Were you, you know, Stephen King writing stories and selling them to your friends on the playground kind of thing? Or what was that like moment where you're like, yes, I want, cause you've written nonfiction, you've ghostwritten, now you're writing novels. Like, what was that moment for you? Or was there one? I mean, I think it's when we moved recently. And so um, I like have this box of journals that I knew that where they were in my apartment. And then I had to put them in a box. And now like I've known where the box is. Hmm. And just recently I've started to be like, stick like a toe into them and be like, you know, let me just like open a page and let me just, I'm a little, I'm terrified of reading them. Because they probably started when I, mean, I, I have a, the same thing. I don't want to read any of it. It's just cr cringy as my 12 year old. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I afraid of? I think I'm afraid of that. I'm just going to be complaining about the same stuff now that I was complaining about at 18. But I mean, what I found in this is that everything I was writing was like about how much I wanted to be a writer and how I had no idea. I mean, it was like literally like saying like, I want to be like, I don't know what's more like, it was just so out of reach. I didn't know a writer, you know, I like, I got my master's in urban planning, you know, like, like it was just, it was, but there was this thing inside of me and it was like, it, now that I'm older, you know, it was like turning 30. It was like this now or never moment, I think where, you know, it, I was like, I was trying to write a screenplay for a while with a friend and like I had attempted a novel, which I actually still have. Um, and it's like, it's kind of sad because like, I just wish that I had found a way to be like, oh, I can, I should give this, I should, here's how you do it, you know? And like, now I feel like writers are very accessible to readers, like very accessible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they can email you and tell you about the swear word in your book that they don't like. But, you know, like at the time there was no way to kind of figure out how do you, how do you publish something? And so, um, I did also realize in this journal excavation is that as soon as I started to write, I stopped journaling. Like there was nothing else that I kind of needed to work out, I think, because it was it was like 15 years of trying to figure out like, how do you do this? And what if I never do it? And how sad will I be if I never do it? And, you know, and so I think for me, it was just this thing of like, I have to, I have to figure a way to do this. To do it. And yeah. And you made it work. So you wrote a number of uh, nonfiction books, which I mentioned earlier, and you also had I mean, I'm calling it like a side gig. It really wasn't a side gig, but you are also working um, with this lawyer in Washington, Bob Barnett, who represents all the big political politicians and does all of their books. And he uh, set you up on multiple ghostwriting gigs. Um, I wonder if you tell the audience about the one you recently did not get. <laughs> yeah, so um, ghostwriting is this weird thing that exists that I think like right. is sort of the secret of publishing that most people don't know about. But it's basically that if you are a famous person and you are would like to write what usually is a memoir, you hire somebody who writes it for you. I mean, you know, in close collaboration like that, the ghostwriter has to get the story from you. And then they write the book and then they sort of put their name on it and say that they wrote it. And so that was my job for, I don't know, 12 years or something. And um, 
and I started to, so Bob Barnett is this, he is what Elizabeth said. He's his attorney in DC. He, he's like, he was, he was Barack Obama's, um, I mean, he basically serves as their agent. So if you have a big, if you want a big book deal, you go to him. And so it was like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and like, you know, lots of Republicans too. And so he had sort of, he was very helpful to me throughout my career where he, I was on his list of people. So he would call me and be like, here's these jobs. And I mean, I had the best, I had like the most interesting interviews. Like I interviewed for Bon Jovi's job and like, you know, I didn't get that. And like Amanda Knox and that, which was a really big book and I didn't get that one either. And so I had decided that I was not, that I really, that I wanted to be done with ghostwriting. And, you know, it was like 12 years. I had done a bunch of books and I wanted to like do something else. But every time Bob Barnett called, I would like basically do whatever he asked me to do because in my head, I was like, someday Michelle Obama is going to sell a, a memoir and she's going to need a writer. And Bob Barnett is going to be the person that she goes to to sell the book. And then maybe just maybe I could like beg him to like, you know, talk to me about this book. And so it was, oh my God, how do I keep this story short? But so I, so I did 12 years of ghostwriting and then I was like, okay, I'm going to finally try fiction. So I, tr I write The Perfect Mother. I get you as an agent, which was like way more than I ever thought was going to happen. And then you sell the book and there was, you know, there was interest in it, which was nothing that I ever imagined. And I was like, oh my gosh, finally, like I'm done with ghostwriting and now this is the path. And so I go out to lunch with Jennifer Barth the editor at Harper who bought our book. And I was, and she had known me a little bit from my ghostwriting days. And I said to her, you know, like I said, a ghostwriting is over, but in my head, I always have this thing of like, you know, the only person that I would ever go back to ghostwriting for is if like Michelle Obama ever wanted me to write her book. And it was like, ha ha ha. Like she would never, like she wouldn't. And then Jennifer says, oh, so you know that Michelle Obama like sold her book last week to, you know, Random House or whoever it was. And I was like, no, I had no idea. And so I go home and I say to my husband, I was like, I'm not going to call Bob Burnett about the Michelle Obama book, right? Like, I'm just, it's stupid. Like, she would never want me anyway. Like, that's way out of my league. And so, but Friday night, I have to email him. And I was like, I heard Michelle Obama, you know, who is it going to be her writer? And he writes back and he says, she's going to do it herself. And she has somebody who's going to help. And I was like, okay, good. Like, as if, you know, but I was like, shoo, I'm off the hook. I can like move on forever and not worry about ghostwriting. And then on Monday, Bob Burnett calls and he was like, okay, I, I got, I got Michelle to agree to talk to you. Like, you have to be in DC tomorrow. <laughs> And I was like, what? And I was like, I have gray roots. Like, what am I going to wear? Like, it was just this, like, so I go to DC and I like go to the secret place that is now like their foundation. Um, but it, they had just, like, they had just moved in like the day before. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm meeting with Michelle Obama about, you know, writing her book. And I get led up into this reception area that's completely empty. And it's just like a guy standing there by the door. And I'm like, are you like the receptionist? And he was like, no, I'm the secret service. And I was like, oh, right, sorry. And I was like, okay, I'll just like sit here and wait, I guess, to meet Michelle Obama, you know? And so on the coffee table, it was like, right when the story had come out that Donald Trump like had said that like Obama was tapping his phones and spying on him. So it's like the, you know, Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, it's all like Trump is spying, you know, says that Obama is spying on him. And I was so nervous and I have, worse. I, I don't normally get nervous, which is, I think, partly why I can do these ghostwriting jobs, because, like, I don't really care that much, mm -hmm. but I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for, it, and, you know, and then, like, the door opens from the hall, and who walks in but Barack Obama, and, like, it's just me just sitting by myself, like, you know, and he sees me, and I was, like, oh gosh, like, he's so cute, and, like, I just want to, like, and I stand up and I was like, hello, Mr. President, you know, like I was in the West Wing or something. And so he was like, oh, you're Amy. Like you're here to, you know, talk to my wife. And I was like, yeah, it was, it was crazy. But so then, I, but I, then when she walks down the hall, I was even more like, you know, like, I can't believe that this is really like, this has happened. And I didn't get the book, which actually probably turned out to be like, okay. Um, but it was like, I mean, I was for me to, like your dream at the same time. I was like, but you have this other dream and we want to keep you on. You did leave and you were like, I feel like she's my best friend. <laughs> I remember I called you on the train back and I was like, I don't even really want to write her book, but like, can we go get our nails done? Like, is there a way to negotiate? Like we, she, like the three of us, maybe could we get our nails done together or something. But, um, yeah. So it was like, that was it. That was the end of this like ghostwriting thing for me that had been a 12 year career. And um, it was a great way to kind of say goodbye to it. Yeah. Right. And he's never going to ask you again, because who does he ask from there? 
But I love um, sort of your transition from, um, you know, from the nonfiction side to the fiction side, because you needed, you had a nonfiction agent and you realized you needed a, an agent who specialized in, um, in fiction. And you had had one last, correct me if I'm wrong, you'd sort of agreed to one last ghostwriting gig that kind of paid you enough money to sort of give yourself a year to write The Perfect Mother. Do I have that right? Um, I mean, it's more that I, I, uh, I, I did one ghostwriting gig and yeah. um, for a political person that ended up, uh, I felt regretful about because I feel like this person ended up having like, like when Trump came in, like it was just like, I was like, ugh. And so in order to, I think to like feel okay about um, having that one job, I said to like my husband, like I need to take this money and use it in a, in a useful way. And so I was like, I'm not going to take another ghostwriting job for one year and I'm going to take that that money and I'm going to use it as a salary and my kids were I think one and two at the time you yeah. know and so I was like we're going to hire a babysitter we're going to figure out a schedule like I'm going to work as many hours as everybody else is working in this house and like I'm going to try and, and I'm going to write a novel and I'm going to give myself one year to do it um and it was funny because I that was like January 5th and then you sold the book on like like January 3rd or something so it was like just under a year so I just have to pipe in, this might not be interesting to anybody but me, but um, Amy <laughs> thought it was a good idea to like send her book out to agents like December 20th. <laughs> and I got it, actually it came to my colleague, Julie Bear, who passed it to me. She's like, I think this is actually a better fit for you. And I, uh, authors send sort of 15 pages in a query letter and I read the 15 pages. I was like, I need to read the rest. And Amy's like, okay, great. But like, you know, three agents want to, you know, I was too slow. Three agents already have offered representation. And I was like, no problem. And we were flying down to Florida. And I just remember just zipping through the book and like throwing candy and snacks at my kids at either side, like, don't talk to me. And like, we land. And I was like, I love it. Can we talk? And you're like, yes. Now, like, 12 agents want the book. <laughs> I just remember being like, oh, this is not going to happen. Talking to you down in from Vero Beach. And I don't know why I just, it makes me laugh, but um, I asked you to come into the office and have a meeting. Um, and I, you know, I told my colleagues, I'm like, you know, I really want to sign this author. I love her work. Um, and you came in, and I think you just had a day of talking to agents um, and you're honestly kind of low energy and you left and they were like <laughs> honestly you were not get that it. impressive get it, get her. like that was the bomb and I thought oh well you win some you lose some but I think you were just exhausted so thank you for well I think it was all the sushi you're forgetting the part that so you took me out for sushi as you have learned that when I get taken out for sushi I we over order get taken out to sushi and we get like shamed by the waiters they're like that's a lot of sushi you're ordering and we're like we know they're like no no it's a lot <laughs> we're like okay we can eat a lot of sushi you have gotten sushi shamed and so I think I just had had too much too much I was like she's taking me out to like this great sushi place I'm gonna eat too much sushi and then I went back to the office and I don't know if I was like expecting that and everybody was like it was really nice and I was like oh I've stopped eating so much sushi yeah exactly. <laughs> but no I knew right away it was a mercury overload. <laughs> um, I do want to open it up. We would love to open up to questions. Uh, there's a QA and a um, in the bottom corner if anybody wants to answer questions. I do see an anonymous attendee said, is mommy a good agent? <laughs> <laughs> That's either your kid or a boyfriend. <laughs> thank you. And Jillian that off thinks we look good. Uh, and Jillian, thank you, Jillian. Um, uh, so yes, don't be shy. Um, I also see that our our Bedford's own Julie Cooper is in the audience and Julie uh, really came to our rescue. She's thanked uh, along with Whitney Brown, another Bedford friend. Um, again, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's like this house of cards when you're just trying to make sure everything's lining up and all the twists are landing and it's also not confusing. and I feel like we taxed everybody at our agency, everybody at HarperCollins, and we were like, we need other reads. And so Whitney and Julie, very kindly, they're big readers, offered um, to read the book. And, you know, I think they spotted some things that weren't working. And that was, um, that was actually really helpful. 
Yeah, that was the tricky thing about this book, um, you know, was that I had to have a lot of early readers because there's things that you can, like, you just don't want to give away and one slip can kind of um, do it. And so, you know, it's hard because it would be, um, it would be fun to like to have this discussion with people after they read the book, because there's, you know, there's just like so much that you can't talk about. Uh oh, you totally froze. Uh, shy, uh, Amy. Spoiler questions for those of you. I, I... Dan, are you there? Elizabeth is freezing. Uh, yep, she froze a little bit. Um, but I have a question. Can I ask okay. a question? Uh, Amy, I'd be yes. curious. Can you? Okay. Um, can you? Can you? When you when you sit down to to write, how do you? Um, how do you plot out the story? Do you do you do like uh, like index cards and make an outline? Do you do like how do you keep every? How do you keep all the balls in the air that you need to tie up at the end? Well, I'm like, what do I need to do in order to throw this book away in one year and start over? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, what I with the last book, um, I I didn't do an outline, which I think is probably why I, I got into so much trouble um, in the beginning. And so I have this book that I'm working on now. Um, so I just wrote, you know, but if, like eventually, like if you read this book, you'll see like the plot is pretty complicated and there's a lot to keep track of. Oh, good, are you there? You're back. She's back. Okay. Um, and so it was, um, you know, so it was eventually I had, I had like a very complicated index card board in the hallway of our apartment. And so, you know, like my kids ended up um, doing their own wall of like index cards and then eventually just like writing on the wall. So by the end of it, it was just like, it was a complete mess. Um, but for this book that I'm working on now, or at least thinking about, like I have, a, I promised myself like nothing, I'm not writing a word until I have like at least a 40 page outline because I don't want to have that experience again of like realizing that it's not going to work or, um, you know, that it's all going to fall short in the end. And so I'm trying to, to avoid that. I, I got thumbs off for a minute. Was that on your next book? And well, you had talked, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I feel, I feel for authors. I've been, Amy's done about 20 of these Zooms already, and you make it look like you're talking about the book for the first time. Um, so I know you've been asked that a, a lot um, of sort of what the, what the next book is. Would you say the first book was harder or the second book is? Oh, the second book was like really hard, you know, as you know, um, actually it's funny. I did not mean to do this, but this is like, this is the cup that you sent me in the middle of writing it that says, I'll calm you tomorrow. Um, because you had texted me at one point, you're like, how are you doing? And I'm like, you know, I'm fine. You're like, you know, do you need to talk? And I'm like, no, I'm cool. And then you're like, okay, I'll calm you tomorrow. And I was like, did Freudian you flip? And I was like, is that really, that's probably what she meant. And then she put it on a mug and sent it to me, which is sweet. I don't know why that made me laugh so hard because I knew you needed calming down and, but I didn't I mean to tell you this story. That's, we but that picture, oh, this is a good story, Amy. We, Amy's first book, The Perfect Mother was optioned by Carrie Washington, who sort of six months after that was in a play on Broadway, an amazing play. And she, in, did not invite me. She invited Amy and Amy was like, can I bring my agent, which was awesome. And we went to the play and got to meet her afterwards. And we're like, <laughs> like we did not play it cool, but she was awesome and lovely. And we kind of, it was a really intense play that um, we kind of couldn't believe. I mean, she's crying, the character's crying oh, at the end of it. Really and powerful play. Minutes later, like, she's they, like- They made it into a Netflix show. Like show. Right, like what? What was it called? The Something Sun. I know. Um, American yeah, Sun. Yeah, right. Um, so that was um, that was really fun, and that belonged on your belonged on your mug. <laughs> we, have, like, we were very uncool about it. You know, we're like, there's like the back door that you go in at the end of the play, when everybody's like waiting outside for the autograph, and we're like, we're just yeah. going in. We're, we're with it. Exactly. Um, Jillian has a question. If you had had to ghost another book, who would you want to write for? Um, I would want to write for President Kamala Harris. <laughs> it's, 
is the next <laughs> that's the next book that I will agree to to ghost write. There you go. Well, <laughs> Bob Barnett might might call you for that. You never know. Um, good. It um, is a funny time to be promoting a book because I feel like you know with the election like two hours away or something. Um, you know, there's so there's so much to compete with, and it's it's interesting a lot right. of a lot of the discussions sort of you know kind of turn political with these. Um, yeah, no, and it's hard, right? It's hard not, to, it's hard not to. Um, and I just sort of, even on my side, I sort of feel paralyzed. Do I, you know, I have this amazing debut that I'm about to send out and I'm like, maybe I should wait because, you know, the election's two weeks away and everyone's distracted. But I actually would say now um, is the time, I think, I mean, I've had so many friends ask me, what can I read? Because they just don't want to, they just need a break from the news. They want that escape, so. Yeah. Um, Oh, and I did have a friend tell me to say this, so I'm not just, you know, pushing pushing books, but this is a really good book and Christmas and the holidays are upon us. So order it now because then you'll have it ready when it comes time um, to give to give presents. I'm always way behind the eight ball on that. So no. And Oblong books in Millerton, uh, New New York. Yeah, New York. Um, New York. They have signed copies. So if you wanted to get a signed copy, you can order from Oblong Books. We're doing an event there tomorrow night. Um, yeah, that's a really good bookstore. And then All right, so I have a question for you. This is what somebody has been saying, like, oh, I want to hear from Elizabeth. But so like, oh. what is it like when you, because you are this incredibly like, you know, world famous agent and everybody wants you to, to work with you. So what is it like when you, when you, do you go to the slush pile? And like, what is it yes. about, like, what is it in the slush pile that will get your attention? No, I'm, I, a lot of my colleagues make fun of me because I read it like voraciously. Um, I, you know, I, if I could figure that out and articulate it better on my bio, I'd probably have a better strike ratio. Um, but, you know, I love anything that feels fresh that, you know, surprises me. And I think, you know, when you're, book came along I was like this feels different it feels elevated it feels like something I haven't I haven't read before um I love a good plot so that's probably why I love thrillers I mean I don't get me wrong I love beautiful language too but I am probably not the agent that's going to take on the very very literary just you know uh voice driven it has to have it has to turn the page for me um so and is there even a slush pile like what is I mean right like nobody I didn't know Julie when I pitched her you know so that was like what is the slush pile it's just like completely people with no connection well I yeah no, I mean right? I but you had in that case some a publisher that you had worked with had given you some names and that's so you were going on that but if you you know and in that case you're you were already a step ahead right because you knew people in the in the industry um but I mean, I would say now it, more than ever, it's really easy to find an agent because you read the books that you think your book is similar to, you read the acknowledgement pages, you figure out who the agent is, you can go on their website and they're available there and you can see what they want, what they don't want, what they've worked on. Um, I mean, it is a little tricky because you know, maybe I don't want a ton more thrillers now because I have have you in my life. Do you know what I mean? I have, you know, I uh, so then it switches. I mean, I do a lot of historical fiction and I get a lot of queries for that, but that isn't necessarily something I want to do more of because I have the authors that I work with. Um, but no, I mean, it was it was sort of you and I connected not that way, right? Um, but that was. Julie got a really nice pair of shoes out of out of your book sale because we don't believe in commission sharing on that kind of thing. But I was like, you're gonna buy a real nice pair of shoes for that. So um, that's that's how we roll at the book group. Um, we have one more question. Oh, Julie Cooper just asked, do you expect the plot of your next book to change depending on the outcome of the election? Good oh my question. God, that's such a good question. Casey. Not a, not. I mean, no, because I can't write my book. Um, if the election <laughs> goes a certain way, like the only, the only way, um, I don't care. I'm just going to talk about it. But like the only way that I can write this book is if Trump doesn't get reelected. Um, because it's a, it's like a, it's a pretty dark look at, I think the forces that 
have brought about this moment in time, you know, and these like, you know, you see it all you've, you're seeing it a lot more as we lead up to the election, like the, you know, the, the stoking of racial division and, you know, all the, the, the violence that we're possibly prepared for. Um, and, you know, and what I'm really super, as, as you know, like it was like five months ago and not that I'm saying I'm like prescient, prescient, but like called you and I was like, do you know about QAnon? You know, and I was like, I really, I'm super into QAnon and not like as a member, but like as an <laughs> observer. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it was like, I, I have I have been doing these very deep dives into this sort of conspiratorial mindset that, you know, has just blossomed in a way that has surprised me, even though I've been following it pretty closely, you know, and now there's a bunch of people running for, for, for Congress from whatever they're, you know, from affiliated with them. Um, so I've been like spending a lot of time listening to like Alex Jones's podcast, Infowars, and, you know, watching Tucker Carl Carlson. And like, I mean, if I don't win the Pulitzer for this book, like, it, forget it. Like, I'm done. I'm done writing. Like, it's, just, it's really hard work just spending time with this. Right. And I won't do like, what? No, I was going to say that there's another question that's in that vein. What area subjects did you have to research for your new book? Do you front load your research ahead of your writing? And it sounds like yes, you did. This one. I mean, this one feels much more, um, you know, I wrote nonfiction for so long. And I think that there's a part of me that like, I will always be like, have a, a love affair with narrative nonfiction. Right. You know, and I read it, I'm reading a lot of it. And so I think that this book might, um, meld the two of them that it'll be you know it'll be the it'll I haven't been drawing on on like I haven't drawn on current events like my daughter did not get kidnapped in Brooklyn and I was like let me you know write about this but so yeah and you know so I but I, if if Trump gets reelected, and who knows what's gonna happen like I can't write this book like I can only I can only look at it like this like whew, sort of you know that, that that didn't happen so now I can explore because I think these things whatever happens with this election those that part of society and American culture has been exposed and we can't you know just if if we have a new president it's not gonna it's not gonna go away um but it's it's like the stuff that's out there is it's like it's intense you know and it's very misogynistic and it's very racist and a lot of it is overt and um you know and I just feel drawn to kind of like I really want to lift up these rocks and try and see like what it is that caused all this to happen um, but it's, I don't know. It's well, I don't even fun. know. Yeah. You know. That makes sense. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you one more question because it is sort of percolating right now. Um, do you think, is there a chance Goodnight Beautiful might be a movie and might you be involved in that in some way or another? Um, I don't know. Do you think that Goodnight Beautiful? <laughs> I do, I do. Amy's in talks uh, with a number of people uh, who, who want to buy the film rights and they want Amy because of the house of cards, um, sleight of hand stuff happening in the book. Um, a lot of people did not know how to put it on, um, put it on film, but you, sort of crack that code. And I think a lot of people are really interested in it and interested in your take. Mm. Um, so well, I think you've been, I mean, you have been integral to this, but you know, we've, Elizabeth and I have like sort of have these like, let's, you know, we both don't live in the city. And so we're like, let's meet on the phone and take these walks in the country and kind of like really hash out how we would, how this would work on film. And I think we, I think we figured it out. Um, yeah. We it's did. a hard book to, you know, it's funny. There's a friend of mine who's, re who's reading it and she's, she's still in part one. The book is in three parts and she's in part one. I saw her yesterday and she's like, this is going to be such a great movie. It's like, this is such a movie. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's keep going. Right. Yeah. I was like, it's a little hard to like, it, it eventually it's like, it, it's a little hard to adapt. And she was like, no, it won't be like, you just have to do it. And I was like, and I was, and then finally I was like, you need to read by this page by Monday. So you could help me brainstorm how to do this. Um, right. But it is. And to it be would honest, be, well, I would. I hope so. I would love. I think it'd be a super fun thing to to try and make happen. Um, well, Jennifer Barth, who I don't know if she's still here. She was. She was integral. Your editor was also integral in sort of saying, "We, I think, I think we could crack this too." And I feel like, oh, that's right. Yeah, I feel like that was really helpful because 
a lot of people in Hollywood at first kind of pushed away from it, but now they're now they're really into it, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, well, if, if, if we don't have any other questions, um, I think we we were told uh, we had forty five minutes, but I don't want to keep anybody. I know it's late, and guys are good. If you want to keep going, kids. I know. I know people have kids to you know. Put well, listen. If it up. does get made into a movie. Um, um, you can commit right now to coming and premiering it at the Playhouse and coming to talk about it. Done. Awesome. Done, done and done Well, we, we also had this idea this too. For anybody who wants to, if, if anybody knows anyone who missed this and wanted to participate, um, there is going to be a recording that'll be on the Playhouse YouTube channel in a couple of days. So right. please feel free to, to share that link. Um, we'll circulate that to everybody. But uh, yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to show that. All right. And we're going to have... We're gonna. We decided we're gonna cast it with Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively, who I understand are local anyway. Because they are local. They are. And they're married. They're on the they Zoom can... at the moment. They don't know they're gonna star in it, but they will soon. But because of COVID, they could actually fill. They could be Sam yeah. and Andy, and we wouldn't have to. We wouldn't have to spend money on testing and all that. Exactly. It'd be very Perfect. easy. <laughs> Bedford could definitely be your upstate fictional town that you set the book in. You could that definitely get that. Fun. It's not far from it. Getting Zoom bombed. So on that note, <laughs> Are you? thank you, everybody. Thank well, you, Thank Amy. you, Elizabeth and Amy. Thank you, Dan. Great. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, and Pops. Hi, Poppy. <laughs> great, great job, Mommy. Great job, Amy. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take it easy. Bye. Okay. Bye.